Thinking about my options, every detail in my head, but it doesn't really matter. Nothing matters, so I cry instead. Hey, sightseers! Sightseeing Sally here. Marty's with me, but he's staying warm in the truck because right now the sun's not out. Today we are in an old mining town here in southern Illinois known as Rosie Claire. Located on the Ohio River, less than three miles southwest of Elizabethtown as the crow flies, Rosie Claire is known by the locals as the town at the end of a dead end of a dead end road off State Highway 146. Now the thing about Rosie Claire and the reason why we came to film here is that if you walk around town, it's like stepping back into the past, into a virtual time capsule. So today, not only we'll be walking around and checking out those items that are like stepping back in time, we'll also be going over some of Rosie Claire's early history so that you can get a feel for what makes this forgotten little town so unique. Incorporated as a village in 1874, some of the townsfolk here can trace their roots back to 1832 when William Pell Jr. settled the land. Initially called Pell's Landing, by the 1890s, the town was officially noted on maps by the name of Rosie Claire. Early accounts differ, however, on how the name got changed. Some claim the town was renamed after the daughters of a French settler, Rose and Claire. Another version passed down by Rosie Claire resident Sarah Wood, who died in 1888, states that when Sarah was a young girl at a party given by her uncle Billy Pell, some of the adults decided to let the prettiest girl there name the town. One of the Pell girls was chosen, and she renamed it Rosie Claire for Red Earth. Now something you'll find very interesting about Main Street is that the locals here in Rosie Claire call it the Million Dollar Main Street. And that's because back in the day when lead miners were mining, they were throwing out the floral spar, which was then being used to construct roads. Later, the mining of floral spar became the town's bread and butter, hence the name Million Dollar Road. Now, if you look down in the road, you can see pieces of something. I don't know if this is actually floral spar in the road, but Marty says it's not what you see normally in concrete, so who knows? Now, if you look out in the street, you can see what's left of the old tramway that used to run from the mine down to the river. And from what I understand, they used this tramway to run the floral spar down to the boats that were waiting to take it away, and then to bring coal back up to the people in town. Once the country's largest producer of fluorite, mining in Rosie Claire began with the discovery of lead ore on James Anderson's farm in the fall of 1839. Soon after, William Pell Jr. discovered fluorospar in Galena, aka lead, on his own land at the place commonly known as Harrison's Diggings. These discoveries are what led to the growth of the town. By the 1930s, fluorite from here was in such demand that there were six mining companies operating out of Rosie Claire. Eventually, Rosie Claire became the site of the largest fluorospar mining operation in the United States. Fluorospar mining didn't come without its hazards. Miners often worked in harsh conditions exposed to the elements. 
and they usually developed serious lung conditions later in life from the dust they inhaled. Not to mention, there was always the risk of injury or death on the job. Since 1915, at least 25 local area miners are known to have died in accidents, including the loss of seven on April 12, 1971. On that fateful day, deadly hydrogen sulfide gas overtook one miner and the rest died during their rescue attempts. In 1995, fluorospar mining became a thing of the past as it then became cheaper to import it from places like China, Mexico, South Africa, and Mongolia. Despite no longer being producer of fluorite, Rosie Claire will always have the distinction of being known as a fluorospar capital of the world. Over here in the park, I came across these curious looking things. And on the placard, it says, Rosie Claire Lead and Fluorospar Mining Company, founded March 1869, mounted April 1969. But I'm not really sure what they were used for, so let's check with Marty. Most likely these were used on a tram system. I don't think they're from this area where they are. They're from somewhere else in the city, but when you look in here how it's v the cable would go in here and wedge, and then that's how they'd keep the cable tight so it would keep pulling as it ran. This is for using in the mining operations? I would assume so, if we're in a tram system or something, you know, like we'd see out west. I don't know if we ever showed any on film, but out west you'd see these here and there. Now as you go around Rosie Claire, you're going to notice that this town is built on hills, and valleys. I mean, it's just crazy how steep the hills are. They just go up and then down, up and back down. Can you imagine what it would be like to have to drive these streets in a really bad winter storm like what we get back home, Marty? No way. And I was told by one of the locals the reason for that is because of the mining here. And actually, I read that underneath the streets, tunnels from the mine crisscross everywhere under the town. These aren't the only telltale signs of Rosie Claire's deeply entrenched mining culture. There's also the location of the former Rosie Claire Lead and Fluorospar Mining Company Mill and Office. Now houses the American Fluorite Museum. Unfortunately, these days the museum is closed. We were told by one of the locals that there was a break in and then, not too long after, a fire. Now, if you look across this series of Main Street buildings, you're going to see a name that keeps showing up as I pan, and that is the last name of Knight. You can see it on the top of this building, and this building, and this building, and last but not least, this building. And that's because of one man by the name of E.A. Knight, who was born in 1872 and whose family can trace their roots back to England. Now, from what I understand, Mr. Knight was a very influential businessman here in Rosie Clare. Him and his brother started a lumber yard. He built a number of homes and businesses here. He started a mining company known as Knight, Knight and Clark. But what he is probably best known for is his role in helping organize the State Bank of Rosie Clare in 1910. You can see it now says Banterra on it. However, I do believe this is the location of where that state bank was back in the day. What's now known as Rosie Claire's Visitor Center and Smoke on the Ohio Restaurant is the former Travis Drug Store. Operated by Roy Travis and his brother Hobart, this would have been the place where you would have come to pick up your mail drink a coke and sit around and visit with the townsfolk and back in the day if you didn't go to church on sunday that meant you were too sick to do anything else that day 
I love how you can still see the names written in the tile at the entryways of the old buildings here. I wonder if that could have been done in later years to honor these early Rosie Claire businessmen, or if it was part of the building's original construction. If you know, let me know in the comments section below. If you look up there, you can see the name of the man who used to run a clothing store in this building. If I remember correctly, I believe it's pronounced Gatesman. As you can see, it's no longer a clothing store, but rather a dentist's office. Besides being known as Million Dollar Main Street and having the remains of the old tram system here, this was once the location of the state's bloodiest labor riot. Back in 1916, according to historical records, 200 armed conspirators paraded the two block million dollar Main Street. There was actually a gun battle here between union workers and Kentuckians who had crossed the river to work in the mines. Anyone who crossed that picket line was viewed as the enemy. Strike breakers were shot dead in their tracks right there on Main Street. In the end, mining officials hired deputies who then drove out 200 some union men and their families. And you all thought Rosie Claire was just a quiet little town. Couldn't be farther from the truth. Now, one thing you probably notice sites here is, especially if you're from Wisconsin, is the lack of bars here in Rosie Claire. And that's because, just like Cave and Rock, Rosie Claire is a dry town. Which means, no going down to the local watering hall and getting all sauced up come Friday night. By the way, don't let this building's exterior fool you. Although it is now the old Masonic Lodge here in town. This was originally built as the town's YMCA. And if I may add, it once had a bowling alley in the basement and was once home to the town's library. And interestingly enough, the town's librarian ran both the library and the bowling alley. These aren't the only places in town that are sure to spark memories for those who grew up here. At one time, you used to be able to get all your ice rink supplies in this building. An old Coca-Cola sign here in Rosie Claire. Marty says it's from probably the 60s or the 70s. Now, one of the places here on Main Street that invokes feelings of nostalgia, at least for me, is Bob's Food Mart. And that's because when you step inside, you're immediately greeted and you have a feeling of being back in your hometown, back in the days before there were the chain grocery stores, when they were just the mom and pop stores. I especially love that they have the old signs marking what's in the aisles. This is definitely one of those places where if you can't find something, you don't have to be afraid to ask. Everybody's willing to help you out. And it just really gives you that real feel good vibe, if you know what I mean. Being located on the Ohio River, one of the things the town's residents have to be concerned about is flooding, which is why if you look up over there, you'll notice the town has built a levee. And on it, we can see markings from some of the times when the Ohio River flooded. Here, we can see it was all the way up to this point in March of 2018. Down here marks for January of 2005 and May of 2011 and February of 1937. Here's a perspective of how high the water got here. Sally's five foot six. There's even a high water mark on one of the streets in town, which shows just how far the river flooded. 
Just like the other towns that were built on the banks of the Ohio River, surviving floods has always been a part of Rosie Claire's history. Here you can see just how bad the river flooded in 1913. The flood of 1937 was particularly devastating. Here we can see the high water mark from the 1937 flood. Yet despite the floods and the loss of its mining industry, the town and its folk have persevered. Maybe it has to do with who these people are. According to one historian, many of the townspeople here are descendants of the early river pirates who made their headquarters in Cave and Rock. The type of people who, no matter the odds, will always come out on top. <laughs>